Welcome, bet riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. Thanks for joining us today, guys. We're happy to have you with us. Let me tell you what's on today's show. We're going to kick it off with uh, a gentleman from South Africa, Stan Potgieter, who is a South African veteran from the uh, 80s border wars. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the things that he's been through in his life and how he has used the tadhole trike. Uh, an interesting new trike that I'm sure most of you have never heard of to uh, to help him overcome some of the difficulties he's uh, dealt with. So I think you'll enjoy that. And then we have our good pal, Sylvia Halpern, who is just kicked off her uh, Route 66 Transamerica tour. Uh, she's on the road right now. And we uh, had the chance uh, last week to uh, sit down with her and also... Um, with uh, Heiko Truppel from HP Velotechnic, uh, who played a big role in getting Myrtle ready for this tour. So uh, I think you'll look, I think I, I will be looking forward. I hope you guys will uh, like that uh, segment as well. And then we have the guys from TerraCycle on with us. There's been a major transition there. Uh, many of you may already know about it. We sat down with uh, Pat and Quinn and Kaz. And uh, we talked about uh, some of the past history of TerraCycle, what's happening there right now, and uh, and what the future holds for those guys. So I hope you'll enjoy that as well. And then we've got a viewer submission, um, which is actually a uh, recumbent bike shop uh, submission. Uh, he, uh, this gentleman, is going to be selling his uh, recumbent bike shop. Uh, it's for sale, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that is. So. Uh, looking for a prospective buyer there. So we'll have that then in the last segment. So first of all, let me introduce you to my crew today. My buddies, Larry Seidman and Trey Burgoyne. Larry in uh, in Colorado Springs. How is it going, Larry? A little windy today, but I'm ready for the show. Good, good. And uh, yeah, keep your hat on then. And Trey, uh, down in Raymond, Mississippi. Uh, Trey, what's up, pal? Yeah, oh, it's an awesome day here. Bright sunshine. It seems like summer. Actually, I cut grass yesterday. So there you go. There's a place where you can ride almost all year round, right? So that's sure. that's Come great. On, all right. Well, let's uh, let's move along here. Uh, if you uh, folks watching would like to participate in today's show, you can join us on the live chat. Uh, you can do so on Facebook by just posting a comment where you see this video. And if you're watching us on YouTube, join the live chat, the YouTube live chat. You can comment uh, on what you are watching. You can ask questions uh, about our guests that uh, and the segments that you see. Chat amongst yourselves. And uh, please do make sure to let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to know uh, about that as well. Now, if you want to support the Laid Back Bike Report, we always appreciate any support you can give us. Uh, you can like us on Facebook. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. And if you want to click that little white eye up there, it is a link that will take you to the Laid Back Bike Report website where you can find out all kinds of other stuff about us, past shows, what's coming up. Uh, you can buy a hat like you see uh, Fred wearing up here. Uh, or, you, or you can also uh, become a Patreon patron. For as little as a dollar a month, like some of these folks right here. So, thanks a lot. If uh, in any way that you can, uh, for any way that you can support us. Now, uh, we are also supported by some wonderful sponsors. Let me tell you about them right now. First of all, TerraCycle, makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent, and Trail Side Trikes a fine recumbent trike shop on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida and now in Knoxville, Tennessee as well. And Terra Trike Greenspeed, 
the best in leisure, performance, adventure touring, electric, and portability. Wherever your adventure leads, Terratrike will take you there. And Greenspeed, where Ian Sims designs bring performance through science and engineering. And Laidback Cycles, the top USA dealer for Terratrike and the premier source for Catrike, Ice, and Greenspeed. We give you the freedom to ride. And Avenue Trikes. With the gearing you need and the comfort you want, it's time to enjoy riding again. They're in stock, ready to ship, and only $19.95. Dealer inquiries are welcome. And Azub. This company is a three-time winner of the Trike of the Year Award and has brought several unique technological solutions to the world of recumbent bikes, including the titanium front suspension on the tie fly trike. Combined with the tuned rear suspension, it provides its owner with absolute comfort throughout the ride. And recumbent PDX. With a 150 trike inventory, recumbent PDX is the West, West Coast's only cat trike megastore. We have over 20 trikes on our showroom floor just waiting for you to test ride through our beautiful Portland neighborhood. Call or email to schedule your test ride today. And EcoCycles, leaders in electric assist and customer support with a line of specialized conversion kits to retrofit just about any bent model out there. Check them out at cycles.eco right now. All right, guys, we are going to jump right into it. We're going to head to South Africa, and we're going to talk to uh, Stan Potheater, uh, who is going to tell us about uh, some of the harrowing uh, events that he has endured in his life as a veteran, and about a new trike called the Tadhole Trike. I think you're going to enjoy this. Larry, let's have a listen. All right, guys, we are here with Stan Pachiter from South Africa. Stan, how are you today? Very well. Thank you, Gary, and you. Good, and we're so glad to have you uh, on the show to tell your story. Uh, let's start out, if we could, at uh, the what I consider the beginning of your story here. Tell us about how you got involved in the military and what your service was like. Basically, Gary, in, in the way it was previously in the old government in South Africa, when you when you get to the age of 16, you have to register what they used to call for the ID book, identification document, but it was actually more so you get registered to, to enroll into the military. It was compulsory for every man in this country if he gets to the age of 16 that he had to enroll, and when he finishes school, whether it was like we called it standard eight or, or um, standard 10 metric. Um, you had to then do two years national service, which was compulsory. I finished in standard eight in 1982. And then in 1983, July, I was enrolled into the military. I was called up and I went for my two year national service here in a town that we call Palaborva. Our training was 11 months, intense training. In military infantry training, intense training. And after that, then we get um, sent up to the border where the border war was since 1966 up until 1996. And um, we went for two stints. First stint was three and a half months, and then the second one was close on eight months that we were spending on, on um, the border. Uh, All right. Now, what what you said, the border, tell me, what, uh, where was this? What border was that? What countries the, were involved? The, the border was, we didn't fight actually in South Africa. The border was we, the old Southwest Africa, which is Namibia today, and Angola on that border. And we were fighting there. And like I said, we had three days left and we walked into an ambush and we were five guys. We worked in a, in a group of five guys and I was the only one that came out of the um, ambush unscathed. Two of my friends were heavily wounded and the... the, the, the um, Section leader was killed instantly. He was shot in the head and multiple other um, injuries as well. But the, the worst one of the lot was in the head, the fatal one to say it like that. So clearly 
you suffered physical harm as well as psychological harm and that uh, and that has stayed with you as well yeah. i wanted to i wanted to if we can uh, jump forward then uh, a number of years at some point you started thinking back over your service and the other veterans uh, that you served with and have and also who have suffered and uh, you're a creative kind of guy good with uh, uh, building things good with your hands and you uh, you started putting together some tributes. This, I think this is a way for you to give back. Tell us a little bit about how this came about. And I had a talk show on the radio and I sent a WhatsApp in because I asked people if they can send WhatsApps in and that. Maybe they've got their stories as well. And I did send that in and I, lo and behold, they contacted me and I briefly explained to them what happened to me and that. And then afterwards they phoned me back and said, no, they, they picked up that there's something not right. Will it be fine if they sent me for treatment to a psychologist? And they were paying for everything. And, I, and because at that stage, my life was in total shambles. I was drinking, drinking on a Friday and a fights on the weekends. That was standard practice for me. Riding motorbikes and fighting and that, that was my standard way of life. And then um, these folks helped me. This, I went to see this woman psychologist, Erika, and she started talking to me and helping me and everything. And then all of a sudden, I've always been making models and that since I was a little boy, I enjoy that. And then I started making these things. I, I can't tell you why. I just saw these things and I've always had this big respect for the military and that and the soldiers and that since I was a little boy. I always used to read a little book, war comics and that of World War War and that. Of World War II, and I saw these um, statues, uh, what the guys did in America, especially after they lost friends or brothers in the, in the war, and they, they put the rifle upside down with his boots and his helmet. So that was like an inspiration to me, and I started making these little trophies with my CNC at home. And that rifle, that R4, that was the weapon that we used when we were fighting. And it took me 410 hours to make the first rifle. So it's on the scale. I'm a, I'm a plastic quali qualified plastic tool maker by trade. And then I see and see that to the standard that it's supposed to be. And I started giving these trophies to family members. But first, the first three I made for the psychologist and the two people of the radio station that, that took the time of the day that saw I had a problem and they took that time to help me. Very wonder, yeah, wonderful thing. So clearly, you this helps people that that you give them to. It also clearly is a kind of therapy for you too, and seems to help you. Now yes. let's let's talk about the effects that uh, that your service and PTSD has had on your family as well. And it's not just you that's affected. It's not just the soldier himself that's affected. There, uh, everyone that surrounds him also uh, pays a price. Tell us about how that uh, happened in your family. Well, the, if you look at the photos top left, that's me and my wife sitting there with my dungarees. Then the photo just beneath that, that's one of the outreaches in the morning where it was my daughter, that one that's next to me with a yellow top. It's Woody on, that's my daughter. Now, this little girl in the center. We went on an outreach one morning to a very poor area, and this lady, this little girl, she had like cerebral applause, applause you. I don't know exactly what they call it in English. But then um, she was part of a family of 11 children, and this child's mother, just that December, we went there that, that, that January, that December, she sold two of her kids to the Nigerians to get money. And then the other photo there in the top right, that's... Another, our old minister of the police back in the day when we were still in military and that. And he was um, also, he started the thing years after many years that he was serving in the police and, and as minister. And the one there at the bottom, that's, we'll talk about that later. That's a, a pastor that I met at Botswana. But the main thing to get back to what you asked me about, what the impact that this thing had on my family. You know, the one day I was standing in a shop making it a shirt for myself for my trip. And I realized I was a veteran. I came out of this war and everything injured and that now mentally and more than physically. But directly connected to me is two children and a wife. 
And my whole marriage was a joke, not a joke, it was a fight, a big fight. And I can understand why today, why my wife was fighting, because she was the one that was bearing the brunt, she and my children, because of the way I was, the aggressiveness, the fighting, it was very tough on them. And that's where my organization started, wearing it for the wounded. Because I realized that day, me as one soldier, I came home with an injury, mental injury. But in that process, I heard so many people around me. I wounded other people all around me. And there's so many of us. Not just, you know, it's not just a, 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 a single situation where it's just one person and that. This is a big thing. It's, it's, and it's international. I see it worldwide because I see the same symptoms in the Americans, in England, in Australia, in, in Ireland, everywhere you see the same situation taking place where these oaks isolate themselves, drink, fight. You know, it's, 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 it's the same. It's like we're all brothers. Now, how did you first encounter recumbents? How did you learn about recumbent bikes and trikes? On the internet, on YouTube, because there's nothing like that in our country. There's no stores that sells recumbent trikes or even the recumbent bicycle, the two-wheel ones. You, I've never seen one in my country. One afternoon, I was on my way home, and the company that I worked for, the Dell, their bus that took the, the, the people from the, the guys that works for us from work to the station, he, he made a judgment error, and he knocked me over with the front wheel, started with the front wheel, and then he pulled me under the bus and he rode over my, my feet, basically out of my shoes and he rode over my whole bicycle with the back wheels. And that day I got a fright. And then um, in December 20, uh, December 02, when I was working in the last factory that I company where I was working, I fell over backwards as tool maker. I was picking up a tool, taking it to the surface grinder, and we call it duck boards. It's wooden boards that we work on, that we walk on. And my foot got stuck in one of these boards, and I fell over backwards with a tool on top of me, and I broke my back again. All right. And so you had multiple injuries uh, to your back and your legs, and this is what I obviously told you you cannot continue with an upright bike. Right. And the you started, told you, yeah, the doctors told you you couldn't ride anymore. And you, you started seeing these recumbent uh, bikes and trikes. I was, you know, so cross. That was part of I was so cross with the world because now the only sport that I had that I was enjoying, because I used to play rugby and then my knee was stuffed. So I couldn't do that. Then I rode motorbikes and I stuffed my back up. And then that also because I was riding cycle to stay fit for the motorbike racing. And now all that was taken away from me. And I said to me, you can never ride bike again. You can never ride bicycle again. It's not good for your back. It will never work. So, you know, that's part of this, this the, the reason why I went into this somber, this bad mode of myself and that with the PTSD. And I was crossed to the world and everything. And one day I was watching these things and I saw this track. And this was very interesting to me. And I, and I started searching into it and that. And then, I came across your show where you were showing all these different um, tracks and recumbent bicycles and, and that Spatsy and all those things where the Oaks have these like shows where every manufacturer bring all the different new models for the year and all that. And that was so interesting for me. But I was starting to search locally here by us, but there's nothing. There's absolutely none of that around here. And even in the cycle stores, if you ask the buyers about it, Nobody knows what you're talking about. And I got this idea in my head that I wanted, you know, to ride with a bicycle again back to the border. But there was no way. I couldn't afford one because if I buy it in America or any other, I mean, that would be the cheapest to buy it in America because if we buy it in Europe, it's either euros, which is more than a dollar, and the pounds is also more than the, the dollar. So the cheapest way is if I need to buy one or wanted to buy one was to buy it in America and then to import it. But with all the duties and everything, that thing would have cost me close on 200,000 rand, which is I can buy a very nice car this side with that money. So, and I never had the money. So that just, the, the, the dam was pulled from underneath me and that idea went out the back door quickly because of the funds. All right. So how did you then encounter some 
people there in South Africa that might be able to help you? What did you What did you discover next? One of my friends there, Barrent. One morning he came and he showed on. We've got these little shell groups on 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 on, on um, WhatsApp. And the one morning he, he put some photographs on here of this trike. But, you know, at first, this dad hole, this golf cart. And I nearly, when I saw this thing, I nearly fell off my stool, chair Because I couldn't believe this thing so close. <laughs> in the town, in the group, everything. And I immediately found Barton. I said to him, yes, but what's this? What have you done here? And he explained to me, no, his son. This is actually the... The, the push card thing that this whole thing started with. His son was a junior in, in university. And we've got a thing that they call Yule. When the first years get into university, they make all these big floats and everything that they go through the streets with and that. And it's all part of fun and that. And then they made this push card to start the guys. And with Barton being a, a mechanical engineer and he's got a doctorate in that as well, he's also a, a lecturer at the University of Johannesburg. He took this thing now to the next level and he started making that golf cart by the name of Tad Hole, the one that you guys see in this photo. He made this and they started manufacturing these things or trying to, you know. He designed the whole thing and he's manufacturing this whole thing, except now for the motor and the wheels and stuff like that. But everything else you see there, the handles, the seats, he makes the canvas for the seats himself. He bought industrial sewing machine. Everything, he bends or every piece of metal on that bicycle, he bends in his garage by himself. And I spoke to him and I said to him, you know what, I've had this idea in my head of riding back up to Angola. It's two and a half thousand kilometers from where we stay to, to just, I don't know exactly for a lack of a better word, it's more like a pilgrimage to find myself. So for a year, I had nothing from bottom than that. And then this thing just kept on growing in me even worse and even more. And then one morning I found him and I said, listen, are you still in for this? And he said to me, yeah, but, you know, I could, yeah, he's, there's reluctancy in, in, in his voice and that. But he didn't want to say no. And so he said to me, we'll talk about it again. And I'm, like a month later, we speak again. And I found him and I said, listen, Barrent. Do I need to get somebody else to help me or are you now really in this? Are you willing to help me? I said, yeah, let's do it. And then a month later, I phoned him and I said, listen, you haven't phoned me. You haven't told me anything. I haven't heard from you. You said we're going to do this, but I haven't heard a word from you. Um, do I really now have to get somebody else? Do, is this now the end of our discussion and that? And it was a, a little bit of a heated discussion, but it wasn't a fight. You know, it wasn't an argument to say it like that. And um, he said, listen, I'll make a plan. All right? And we left it there. A week later, the guy phones me, and you can show him the photo. He said to me, you better get to my house. We need to see where uh, – to measure you to, so that we can see where in the frame we need to put the crank. And, I mean, this is the actual truck that I now went and sat on, that he built for me out of nothing. Stan, that's great. Let's. This is really exciting. I think maybe at this point, let's start taking a closer look uh, at this trike and how it developed. So let me go through some slides here, and you can talk about uh, what he did and what uh, you asked for and how this developed. So let's go here. Okay, go ahead. Well, this, this is now... Since I've been that day there, they measured me. Now you can, the guys can see, yeah, the crank's put in. But I'm sitting very much upright there. Because this thing was based now on the, on, on the golf cart. So you had different plans. If you see the gap between the pillar that's behind the seat and the, the upright of the seat, there's, there's quite a, a big gap there. Even though we made the frame shorter, he made the actual frame shorter to, to accommodate the track. But we kept it like that. This is how we then finished it. Baron then went and he made my chain there. It's three normal bicycle chains. It's 4.1 meters in total length. So we had to make these little like derailers that just keeps the, it's like jockeys. We call them jockeys here on the back of the wheel, your back wheel. And, and that's just to keep the chain in line so that the chain doesn't wobble and jump around and that and fall off. So you make two of those things to keep it in line, basically. And this is now the day 
just before I rode my bicycle for the first time. This was Finnish assembly. And yeah, <laughs> people, I don't know. It is, I don't know if there's words in this world that I can use to describe to you guys how I felt that day. Because this was like a pipe dream. And this man made it come to life for me. This was like Geppetto and Pinocchio. And I was like Pinocchio on that bicycle. Because this little boy started walking. And I mean, I could then ride. And I sit on this thing. You can see at the back, the seat's very high at the back behind my shoulders there. We then later made it shorter and everything because this was just, you know, the basic thing. There were small little things that I asked him just to change. But the length of the, the, the bicycle, the actual track, where, the way I was uh, um, pedaling, we didn't know anything or how to measure the length because we were used to sitting on a normal bicycle, the normal way how they measure your legs and to set the bicycle up according to how you need to do it. And this, after that day that I had, the first ride on my bicycle, we took the whole thing apart because it was still bare metal and it was sent in for powder coating in this. And this is now where we're actually putting that track together. That gentleman helping me there is Lloyd. He works for Barent. He's his assistant and an assembler. And I was helping Lloyd there to, to put this track together. This is the rear wheel with a hub motor, a Fung 750 watt. And the, that the battery goes into that um, configuration above the um, rear wheel to give us a bit of weight on the back wheel because that's one of the problems that we had. And this now, you can see there, that's where it stands, finished. And if you see this forks here in the front, they're lying horizontal. That's the way, it's, it's, it's joined to the kingpin and that's the way where the front wheel went in and it had drum brakes. But with me being a bit heavy, I weigh on, at that stage I was 138 kilograms. It, and with the trike being 55 kilos, it made us two together very close to um, 200 kilograms. So those, this, uh, those, those um, hubs, the, the, those drum brakes, they, they weren't very effective. They stopped me, but they didn't stop me in an in emergency. So, and it was cable pulled. So we then changed that to, to hydraulic brakes, but that was only later. Everything that we've got on this bicycle is all standard. Basically, we only got Shimano brakes on it at the later stage, but also the, the, the baseline entry stuff. Everything else is from India. It's cheap, cheap cycle parts that we could get our hands on because the budget was so small. I didn't have a lot of money, nor did Barton have. So we tried to get the stuff, the crank set in there. That's the normal crank that works with the old, those round BB clusters with the ball bearings in. That thing has done 11,000 kilometers, no hassles. My chain, I got 9,000 kilometers out of a normal chain, and then I replaced it without any problems. I've never had a punch on this bicycle. And um, no mechanical failures up until now or anything. And I've done 11,000 Ks on my track this far. You guys can hear now the video that we've got. You can hear, see now wh what it looks like. This is the track with all the um, modifications and, and, and changes now. This is basically a walk around the bike. You can see this is the back. This is where my battery goes in, slides in, and it locks up with that. Um, here's a hub motor. 750 bar, Bafang, and there's just this, this little box here, controller box. You can see the seat flips open, takes another two spare batteries, one on each side, but they're not connected, it's just to, to carry them with. And um, that side, that little boxy there, it's just like a, um, like a carry-all on a car, it's just to put all the small little things that I need to carry with. Yeah, you can see we've got side mount wheels, this is basically my brakes. It's just water bottle holder. There's my little control panel for the battery, uh, for the, yeah, for the battery, for the motor and that. This one is just a thing that measures the distance and that. This here in the front is what I call is my little selfie stick. When I'm riding, I put my phone up there. I can have conference calls. As I'm riding, I can speak to people. I can make videos, I've done that before. There you can see this is basically the suspension. 
It's very difficult to, you can see how it moves. Again, this, this bracket there is just my selfie stick. There's the gears in the front. Here you can see, this is the actual black derailleur that we made ourselves. Just to get the uh, um, tension on the chain, with the chain being 4.1 meters. The right wheel, there, you can see, that's our steering mechanism. That's physically how the steering works. And go through, this side is just a little caviar box, like what you guys call a glove compartment. This is my, like my glove compartment. And that's basically it. And yeah, I've got a, a little mirror at the side. Here's my gear shifter up and down. And my brakes are independent. Left brake, left wheel, right brake, right wheel. Don't have any brakes on the back wheel. It's a uh, eight speed at the back and a three speed in the front. So it's basically like 24 speed. And then I've got another five settings on my controller that I can set and take it to a 96 speed. And then I've got another couple of settings that I can play around inside the controller. If you look down here, you'll see there's another little derailleur type of thing. Call it a jockey, just to keep the tension on the chain and to keep the chain nice in line so it doesn't fall off and derail and all that. So that's basically my job. The long and the short of my trike. So where, what have you done with the trike since? Well, if you look at this photo on the left, that's, I, I received my trike on the Monday. This was that Saturday. We had a, a thing in a, at the church where we would either walk, run, or cycle for Bibles to collect money so that we can distribute Bibles. And I, being thinking that I'm fit and I'm, I would be able to ride this trike, I ended myself for the five-kilometer ride which I did finish, but <laughs> I nearly paid the ultimate price. I felt like dying that day because you guys can see there was no battery on there and that, that we didn't put it on. I was training to get my legs fit and that. So we, 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 we didn't, the up wheel was in at the back, but the battery was not mounted so that we, I didn't have the electronics yet. So that was a tough ride. And then I realized, listen, <laughs> I needed to get trained. I need to work to get fit for this ride that I wanted to do of two and a half thousand k's. So with the bicycle being so wide, I can't ride on the normal road. So you have us, there's a, a shopping center about a kilometer from my house. And um, they've got a big gym there and, and they've got a massive parking bay. And, and it's paved area. So I went to the management of the um, shopping center and I explained to them what I want to do. And, and early in the morning, it's five o'clock, I'm there. And then I ride on the outside perimeter of this parking bay. And one lap around that is 360 meters. So I started riding there every morning. And I do 1.2 kilometers every morning. And I carried on like that. And then eventually I ended up doing um, 20 kilometers a day in the morning stay. And then I realized, but this is getting a bit, you know, I was doing in a region of 70 to 80 laps in the morning, if not more. And then I realized I have to get somewhere else where I can train. Tell us about the photo on the right. So what is this? That's that's at the Foot Tracker Monument. That's the area where I can ride. It's an enclosed area. It's 5.3 kilometers. It's got a nice hills and everything there. And there's no cars, nothing. There is cars riding there, but we've got to ride away there. Cyclists and people that runs and that. So, so I started training there. But when I got there, I was doing an average of about 20 to 25 kilometers a day. And I started riding there. And then I realized, you know, I'm going to have to be able to ride between 80 and 100 k's a day if I do this trip of mine going up to Namibia of two and a half thousand k's. So what I did, that I started riding 20, 20 to 25 k's in the morning. And in the afternoon, I go back and I do the same. And it wasn't long. I was doing 55 kilometers in the morning, 55 kilometers in the afternoon. And that was last year, February. Let's start with the day of the ride. That uh, yep. So this was a very emotional uh, and and tough day for yep. you. Tell us tell us about that first day. This this photo on the left, that was the, the last changes. And that's also a new seat cover that was 
put onto my bike. And my trike, if you look at it, you'll see I, I called it, I gave it a name. Even though it's it's a tad hole, Lynx, the manufacturer's name, but I physically gave my trike his own name, and the name is Merkaba. And it's named after the Israeli tanks that they use in the Israeli war. And the num if you translate the name Merkaba, it means chariot of God. Because this is how I felt about this thing, and this is still how I feel because what happened with me and everything. But this photo on the right is my daughter. And that's, that's one of the most emotional days I ever had in my life. Words cannot explain to people how I felt that morning. I mean, we, we, this is another photo of my old family on the left. It's my son and his wife. Then it's me, and then it's my ex-wife next to me. And then it's my daughter and her boyfriend. And I mean, this is another thing that happened before this, that my wife, after all these years of the PTSD and that after 29 years of marriage, she divorced me just prior to this trip. And, um, but we're still on good foot in and everything. And then I went on a trip and that morning it was, it was bad. It was really very emotional. Now, now you leave, you know, and, it, it, when we started riding, I realized, but you know what? I don't even know where I'm going to sleep tonight. But that was not a problem to me because I was on my run. And I was, in my heart, I was so happy because now I'm going on this ride. And I was supposed to do the first stint up until this board. This photo on the right, where we turn to Khlabatsi, that's now going to Botswana border. From there, it's 65 kilometers. To 56 kilometers to the Botswana border, actual border post. And I was supposed to ride this distance from Pretoria to there in three days. I did it all in one day. I rode 115 k's one time. Because when I started riding, I couldn't stop. It was I felt so nice that we just kept on. And we didn't have place to sleep because we were going to sleep in the four courts of garages or anywhere where we could just stop the van and, and have a sleep. And the first day we got a phone call. Lady said to us, we've got a um, like a resort. You guys can come sleep here tonight. Free of charge. It's on the house. And it went like this right through everything. People filled out tanks with diesel. They gave us food. Before the ride, when I started training, I lost 10 kilograms during the training. When I came back from my trip from Namibia, I gained 5 kilos of the way that the people treated us. This was now directly after, a week after we came back from our ride, when I came back, this behind me is like Arlington Graveyard in America. This is at the Fort Tracker Monument. That's the wall of remembrance of all the fallen soldiers during the war of since 1966 to 89. After this remarkable trip that meant clearly so much to you, uh, a major new idea started forming in your head about what the next big adventure tour would be for, for you, Stan. What, what is coming up next? What are you thinking about now? As I got back home, a lady phoned me. And she asked me, can she send me? We call it a pakia. It's like a little parcel. And when we were on the border, that was a standard thing. Your family used to send you a little pakia, pakia like that. And it's got like sweeties in or what you guys call now beef jerky. We call it biltong, a drovors. So things like that. There was biscuits and things like that in cigarettes and so. So I was thinking maybe this is what she wanted to do. Actually, when I opened the, the parcel, these little books were in it. If you look at it, this is now just translated to the Afrikaans, but this book's origin is out of America. This is all about a guy, Mark, that was part of um, your military, and he went to the, um, Afghanistan, and the same thing happened to him. He was an explosion in that, and then he, he had PTSD. She then sent me this book and said to me if I can read it and that, and I was so happy, and I made connection with Mark in America, and we spoke a bit and that. And then before I went on my trip, a friend of mine, he, he, he does um, test rides for motorbikes and that, motorbike companies and that, and then he writes um, reviews about it. So he wrote my story, what happened with me. They took that 
and I made my little storybook. That's basically the same as, as what Marx is. And that's why I just want to promote PTSD, that people can understand what PTSD is about and start helping other people with it. So that was now with this little book, and I got this plan in my head that I want to take this thing now international. Because, I mean, you guys in America know yourself. How many veterans have these similar problems in your country? In America, Argentina, England, you name it. I mean, the Falklands, every war that was there, these Oaks, these, these, these veterans, they've got these problems. And then I came up with the idea I wanted to go right east-west across America. But I don't want to just do it by myself. I want to ride with the American veterans. Guys that's got similar situations than me. And um, that's, I've spoken to Mark, and he's willing to do something like that with me when I'm in the States, if I ever be able to get it right. I want to start at one point and ride across the country. Look at, uh, it's, it's an arena about 5,000 kilometers, but I know we're going to crisscross over the country. So it's not going to be just 5,000 kilometers. It might end up 8,000 kilometers, might end up 10,000 kilometers. I don't know, because we're going to ride from state to state, from county to county, meet people. And the idea is also if I'm in the one county and I go to the next one or town, I want to ride with the veterans. Gentlemen, that's got the same problem that I had and still have. And I want to meet them and I, we want to do things together. I want to go to Arlington. Um, Arlington National Cemetery. Yeah, National Cemetery. That Since I was a little boy, this is something, you know, we saw that on TV way before computers and that, and I saw this. And this is one place that I always want to go to. I can't tell you why. I, I don't know what, what's the reason, but inside me, I've got this drive. I want to go there, and I want to see the changing of the God there because there's no nicer uniform in the world. I'm proud of my uniform, and I'm proud of my Green Beret that I worked for and that I earned to wear. But those guys of the Marines with their white uniforms, like the officer and the gentleman that movie, there's not a nicer uniform like that in the world. And when you see things like that, well, me as a person, I've got so much respect for that. And, and that's why I want to do it. I just want to help every other veteran in the world. And the idea is to ride across America. And when I'm done, I want to ride around Australia. And when I'm done there, I want to ride from Cairo to, to uh, from Cape Town to Cairo, but a solo. And I've, I've sent a video to you where the little caravan that I'm busy manufacturing. This, this is what I want to talk to uh, you about now. So, Stan, let's, these, these are amazing plans, and I think you're going to get a lot of support. You are an amazing fella. And uh, just so the folks get a chance to see some more of your handiwork, uh, you 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 uh, put together a scale model of a little trailer or what you call a caravan that you can actually stay in. Let's have a look at that right now. Yeah, you can see this is a third scale of the model of my um, little caravan that I would be pulling behind my truck. So this thing is from right to left in length. In total length, it would be two meters. And um, to start with, this is just a little pocket on the side and the front that slides out. And on this thing, I'll have my little burners, gas burner and so forth, where I can make food and my little cup of coffee and things like that. And then um, the whole thing would be made out of um, a plastic PVC. And then I'm just going to make the cover the outside with what we call poor man's fiberglass. We use cotton rag. And then we mix paint and glue, and we just cover it with that. That will just to to make it a more weatherproof, so that it's you know waterproof. Water can't get into it. But basically, if you look at the side here with the windows, with me being a bit tall and I had five big back operation fusions in my back and that, so I can't sit in it. And the height in this thing, if you look from the bottom to the top, would only be 900 millimeters. 
So I won't be able, with me being taller than that, to sit inside the door. So basically what I came up with is the whole of the back end. It just flips open. It's got a hinge door like that. It flips open. And then I'll be entering in here from this side to sleep in. If you look at it down and below, my legs will be at the other end of that, at the bottom. And here, uh, in the top here, this side here, if you, the side entry there, here, I'll be putting some clothes and a little battery and things like that. It's basically just to be out of the weather, to sleep at night, to be enclosed from the weather and the animals and all like that. And this is basically my, what my little, um, caravan looks like if I ever get to make it. I'm busy now getting the, the stuff together so that I can start making the actual one to pull locally. And here you can see that's how the door hinges. And the door just closes like that in the back and it sets in and it closes. If, if the door is open like this at night, when you open it, I'll be having um, a leg this side, like a little jack that slides down, a man, you know, just a normal tube with a, with a nut. It slides down, and the same this side, just to give it stabilization when I get in here. But here you can see this, this, this mouth of the back is big and open. So if I sit here in the mornings to put my shoes on, to drink a cup of coffee and that, it's perfect. And I'll be using exactly the same size wheels, the 16, well, actually 20 inch wheels of the bicycles on this trailer. So the height will be exactly the same as my truck. So when I sit here at the back, it would be easy for me just to put my shoes on and all that in the morning. And I can get up. There's nothing hindering me from getting up. My head won't be bumping or anything. And I just close this back end and off we go. Sorry. All right, so that caravan stand is amazing. Now, let's finish up with finding out how our viewers, uh, anyone watching this video, can help you to achieve the goal of you getting on tour in America and beyond. How can they contact you and how can they help you, Stan? Well, Gary, basically, um, the idea is you've, you've got my email address that they can put on there. And then at one stage... We want to try to see if we can, if this thing will get from the ground up and if we can get um, a, like a crowdfunding type of thing organized where people can make contributions. Because the big thing is, is, is just to get funds to get the plane ticket for me to get to America. We're busy, Tad Hole with Barrent, they're busy in Texas with a friend of his that used to work with him this side that's now stays in Texas to see if they can get this thing off the ground that they're going to manufacture the tad holes in America. So now if that works 100%, I'll be riding with a tad hole in America because at this stage, I'm like the factory test rider. You know, I, I, my, my trike is the only one in the world, the tad hole tricycle. There's, there's no other made yet. There's, there's, there's um, one that was made for a, a quadrupedia guy that, that broke his back on a motorbike. So he rides it. It's, it's very similar like the, um, the, 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 the golf trikes or the golf carts. It's, it's with a the throttle. There's no pedals involved in that. But mine that has pedals, that's pedal assist with the motor. That's the only one there is of that, that whole trikes in the world. So the thing is, is if, if, if they can get it managed that side, then, then I would do the ride there with one of the tad holes. But if that not come off the ground, and then I have to make a plan to get a trike in America, which I would then have to use to ride across America. And okay. Yeah. Any one the, of the yeah, the the uh, the tad hole, you being able to ride one of those tad holes here uh, with uh, it, them being manufactured in Texas would work out great if we can make that work. So yep. finishing up then. People should be able to contact you by your email, which I'm going to put in the description below, and also follow you on Facebook because you'll be making announcements, keeping people up to date then on yes. Facebook as well. And I'll put the link to your Facebook profile in the uh, description below. So Stan, uh, thank you so much for uh, for spending some time. It's been a pleasure to get to know you, uh, to learn about your past, uh, the bravery and your wonderful ideas to help other veterans around the world. 
Do you have any uh, final thoughts to leave uh, for us? Well, but Gary, I'm just a mere mortal one, my friend. The thing is, is I must thank you guys. Because if it wasn't for your show that I found on, on, on YouTube, and that none of this would ever happen. Because it started there. That's you. You were the seed. That's that little seed. And this is where, where it's grown to now. And, I mean, now you've given me this platform as well where I can speak to you and you're willing to put this video out there. You know, I, I, I've got no words to thank you. Well, you're very kind to say those things, Stan. I appreciate it. You're 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 the guy that has done all the amazing things and suffered for so long. I'm very honored to give you a platform, my friend. I so, appreciate it, Kenny. Okay. So with that, I think we'll leave it there. Stan, thank you so much. Good luck to you. We'll be following along and see how you do. Thanks, Gary. Go well. Thanks to all the viewers. All right. Quite a privilege for me to have gotten to know Stan. I uh, hope you guys will support him as the plans uh, evolve uh, for his trip uh, to America, uh, his lifelong dream. Uh, hopefully the tad hole will be made here and that will all happen for you, Stan. So Stan's on the live chat as well, guys. If you want to continue to talk to him, he is available there. And thank you very much, Stan. We appreciate it. All right. I think at that point, at this point, we're going to move along then to uh, Sylvia Halpern. I had a chance to spend a little time with Sylvia and Heiko Truppel, who uh, is the marketing director for HP Velotechnic in Germany. Uh, they have a pretty close association at this point. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll jump right in here and hear what Sylvia and Heiko have to say about this uh Route 66 Cross America tour of theirs. Larry, let's have a look. All right. So Heiko Truppel from Germany and Sylvia Halpern out in California. Welcome to the Laidback Back Report, guys. Hey. Hi, Gary. It Thanks is, for inviting us. It is so great to have you on to tell the story of uh, Sylvia's uh, next adventure here. And we're going to start out, I think, with Heiko. Um, representing HP Velotechnic. Heiko, tell us, if you would, a little bit about your background uh, with HP. Now it's my seventh year as online marketing manager for HP Velotechnic. And um, it's still fun. It's still interesting to work with interesting people, fascinating people, um, not only in my company, but um, also like people like Silver Halpern, which I um, got knowledge there. We don't have many testimonials or sponsors or sponsored testimonials. Um, by the time I started there on the international side, we had Matt Gallard and um, HP Velotechnic was not really online. And um, when I started there, I got deeper into the com community and very quick, very, very quickly um, um, saw Sylvia and what she was doing and that she was riding an HP Velotechnic trike for years, doing um, great, great work and everything. And um, we just didn't know she was she was out there. And um, yes, I we got in touch and um, we stayed in contact and we talked and Sylvia produced so many interesting things, not only about the bike, but um, I, I really much liked um, the way she gave tips and tricks for for travelers and everything. So she was not like an HP Velotechnic testimonial. It was like a traveler who wanted to share everything. And uh, by fortune, she was sitting on a HP Velotechnic trike. That that kind of, was, yeah, that kind of brings us to where we are now, where you had found out, I assume, like I did, that Sylvia had intended to go on another tour uh, with Myrtle. And at some point, Ed Sylvie, you might want to chime in here too. I'd like to hear the story of how Myrtle has now become upgraded. You know, it's, I mean, it's really a pretty funny story because I had no intention of upgrading the trike. It never even occurred to me to upgrade the trike. I felt fully confident that my old Myrtle would make it. Um, but I brought it in to bent up cycles to do a maintenance, make sure everything was ready to go for the new tour. And Dana and Raina both said, you know, Sylvia, this 
this frame is really pretty old. Um, it doesn't appear that there's any anything obviously wrong with it, but it's definitely out of warranty. And, you know, you might want to talk to HP and just see how they feel about you going out on a frame that's out of warranty and... Um, so, you know, yeah, do you have some idea, uh, some sense of how many miles are on that frame? At, at least 60,000. Okay. <laughs> yes, at wow. least. Yeah. I okay. mean, it, it has been, I mean, it's not just a lot of miles, but it has been on any kind of transportation you can imagine. So, of course, it's been on a lot of airplanes flying, you know, to the beginning of tours and then back home. But during tours, it's on vans and taxis and trucks, ferries. It's been on canoes, right? It's been on boats. I mean, anything you can imagine. So it's not just riding. This trike has taken me seriously all over the world. So I have been on six continents in over 20 countries, um, a lot of Southeast Asia, Morocco, Turkey, China, all over Southeast Asia. I've done two cross-country U.S. trips. The last big trip that I did, which was four years ago, I spent six months striking in Colombia in South America. Um, I've done six months in Mexico, Belize, Guatemala. So, yeah, it's – I've – yeah, this trike has taken me a lot, a lot of places. Okay. And so maybe Heiko, can you chime in here then and tell us how you decided at HP to uh, upgrade uh, Myrtle uh, after, was it after hearing about this upcoming tour? Yeah, actually, we, uh, we've sent some stuff uh, before, like the track fenders. And um, so we, we were open to support anyway. And the seat. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the seat, yes. Oh my God, beautiful seat. <laughs> Yeah, you must have one of the first there. The question came up, will it be enough? Will the trike has to go 9,000 miles? Um, it's her only, only partner, so she's leaving the truck and the trailer behind is only the trike again. And, uh, of course, you need a reliable, par reliable partner there. Uh, and, yes, the question came up, is can you... Can we warranty that this frame will hold? And we said our warranty is 10 years. So after 10 years, uh, maybe it's just time for a new frame. This is the opportunity. And um, I believe uh, Silver will make another 60, 70, 80,000 miles on, on this track. Yeah. So, and you know, it was getting pretty close to when I wanted to start the tour. And I was a little worried mm -hmm. like, can we do this? Um, and I must, I have to tell you, so I went and I picked it up yesterday at Ben Up Cycles and they had the old frame. So I'm, you know, I see the old frame sitting on a stand at Ben Up Cycles. I'm walking around it and oh boy, does it look tired. It looks really tired. And I thought, you know what, that really was a smart thing to uh, replace the frame. It wasn't just you know, I think I it, it made it really made sense when I saw the old frame. Raina, the uh, uh, the amazing mechanic at Ben Up Cycles, put together uh, a time lapse of uh, the upgrade from the frame you see here to the new one. And so let's take a look at that. What a, what a big job! She's moving everything from the old trike. And moving it to the new track. I, I, I never did find out how long it took her to do it in real time. That must have taken most of the day. Yes, I, this, this is a day's work. Uh, and um, yes, the, the, uh, the job was not um, that simple because we could not send a standard frame kit uh, because we want to save the motor and the motor system is... Um, I think we did it three years ago. Yeah, three, three or four years. years ago. Yes, three years. And um, so Shimano, Shimano already launched um, two more generations of uh, of the Steps E8 flagship. And uh, so it was a bit tricky. And um, I was worried and had an email with uh, Rainer. And she was just like, no problem. I can do that. 
And uh, yes, I see the result. Hi, Hi um, tell us what exactly was replaced. So obviously the frame. What what all got replaced for Myrtle? Um, we we had to. I mean, the, we had to send a frame, and we had to uh, had to send a, uh, the harness, the the wiring harness for the um, for the motor. And so Rayner's job was to uh, split at the right, split the motor system. Um, on the right spot to uh, reconnect it, the new part and the old parts, because you couldn't have, you couldn't have, um, use all the parts. At HP Velotechnic, um, we do all the internal cabling, um, which is why we, uh, why we didn't offer um, steps uh, retrofit kits for long. I, I'm not sure whether we, whether we offer it in in the states at the moment. Um, because we say the, the wiring, the wi wiring inside is so difficult um, that we want to make it ourselves, and so Reina was forced to split it. She, um, but uh, yes, I mean it works. And when I see it, it's as if she was uh, trained in our shop. It's really amazing. Yeah, I asked her how how often does this happen where people move things from one frame to another, and she said it really isn't very often. And it's uh, it's already a bit tricky um, if there's no motor system. But if you have to cut a motor system with new parts, old parts, and bring them together, this is just uh, yes. And Sylvia, what uh, emotionally? How does uh, watching this and and seeing what happened here from old Myrtle to new Myrtle? Uh, how does that feel? Yeah, it's going to take a while to get used to this new. I, you know, I saw the old frame there in the shop and it, oh, it was like kind of sad, you know? Um, and, but it, of course it writes beautifully and I think I'll get used to it pretty quickly. At, almost everything on it is, you know, pretty new. I think the oldest thing on the old frame was the roll off, which is four years old. The um, Shimano steps is three years old. Almost everything on the trike had been replaced at some point. I think the only things that are original are the front wheels and the brake levers. Um, I mean, the brakes are new. The rotors are new. Um, Mel, every Comet BDX, had um, a rear rack. He just had it sitting in a corner. He sent it to me. So um, even that is new. Um, the light in the front is new. And I've replaced the pedals. Um, so, yeah, pretty much everything is no more than four years old on the trike. And is that the bottom half of Dana Lieberman making a cameo there? Was that who that was? Yes, I think so. I think so. <laughs> okay, and we are just about done, I believe, here. Yeah, it looks pretty, doesn't it? Awesome looking trike yeah so new tires new tubes welcome myrtle 3.0 First self-driving trike from HP Velotechnic, ladies and gentlemen, there it is. You tip your hat and a little shout out to Dana Lieberman and Raina at the Ben Up Cycles for all that they have done.
how did you change from just triking uh, by yourself to going with a truck and trailer? Yeah, so this is something that happened just before the COVID pandemic hit. And I had done a tour down the Pacific Coast in winter. I went from, it was actually when I first had the electric assist installed. And so I thought, oh, I should go on a tour. And so I left Portland and I went to visit a cousin who has a Thanksgiving in Berkeley. And it was really cold and wet and rainy. And there's wonderful camping all the way down. Hiker biker, seven bucks. But it was so cold. I ended up staying in hotels. And, you know, hotels in the U.S. are really expensive, like 150 you know, on the weekends, it can go up to $200 a night. And I made this joke about how I could have been making payments on an RV for the amount of money I spent on hotels. And I am telling you, absolutely everybody just got so excited. They were like, Sylvia, that is the best idea you have ever come up with. What are you waiting for? Get yourself an RV. I, I never thought of having an RV, but then suddenly I had friends who knew about RVs. They picked out the perfect RV. In fact, Gary helped me. Gary and Trey both helped me pick out the perfect trailer. I cannot imagine having a better advice than what I got. So I ended up with a truck and a trailer. And the whole point was this was the only way I could travel with my trike and have it be safe. So the trike fits inside the truck. And you can see I've got ramps so I can get it in and out of the truck bed. And I just went around looking for places to ride my trike. So I was visiting all kinds of rail trails and bike paths and, you know, groups going on group rides and club rides and all, really all over the United States for the last three years. You know, there's lots and lots of things about RVing that I really enjoyed. Um, but one thing that was not great for me was the lifestyle. I loved being able to drive around and ride my trike. Um, but looking at the world through a windshield, I really got tired of it. And I really missed being on my trike, being able to stop and take pictures and look at things and talk to people and really go as slow as I wanted. And so I just said, well, why not? I, I mean, why can't I do that? So that's, that's really how it started. And I think the first time I really talked about it was at recumbent CycleCon um, last, I guess, last October. Yeah. Yep. And so since then, you've, you've put some plans together and, uh, and, and thought through what you're going to need and all that sort of stuff. So why don't we, if we can, start talking about it. Well, uh, first of all, when, uh, what's the date? When is the latest? Uh, what, what is the latest as to when you're going to be taking off? The start date. Yeah. So, um, you know, actually, it was going to be today. And um, I have had a number of things happen, so I had to push that off. But it's either going to be March 1st or March 3rd. And um, I have a friend that's going to drive me to the, the closest point on Route 66 here in Southern California. Um, and and that's, that's where I'm going to be starting. Now, the biggest difference between this tour and previous tours is I'm going to be using electric assist. And because I'm going across the country, um, you know, I, I was a little bit, well, I, I guess, I guess my, my concern was staying in hotels is, um, prohibitively expensive. It's really a budget buster and I need to camp probably as much as I can. And so I have two batteries for the electric assist and I felt pretty confident that would get me. Uh, one or maybe two days without needing electricity. Uh, but I kind of wanted to have the freedom to go three days. Like, for instance, there are campgrounds that are considered primitive. Um, you know, they're bona fide campgrounds, but there is no electricity. And so I wanted to uh, not have to worry about charging up every day. And so I asked Heiko if he could send me a couple of batteries. And he said yes. And so now I'm traveling with four batteries. Uh, but what this does is it makes the weight of my gear 
beyond the weight limit for the rear rack of the trike. And so I have switched to a trailer. So I'm going to be pulling everything with a burly nomad trailer. So I'll have two batteries in there and then um, all of my gear. That's probably the biggest change. So tell us a little bit about uh, the route and how you plan on coordinating uh, where you are on a daily basis for this tour. Yeah, so another really big change for this tour is I have always traveled in the winter, over the winter months, and then spent my summers in Portland. And now that I have my RV, I have given up the house in Portland, which has opened up touring in the summertime. And so I can explore more of the United States. I'm really excited to be able to do a route that has been on my bucket list for a long time. And so I'm starting in Southern California, and I'm going to be taking Bike Route 66. This is a route designed by Adventure Cycling Association. They're a bike advocacy group, and mostly what they do is design bike routes all over the U.S., and they uh, make very, very nice maps for them. It's, you know, if I have a choice to do an ACA route, that's definitely what I'm going to be doing. So that's going to take me to Southern Missouri maybe close to 2,000 miles. And I've already been in touch with people along the way. So I know there's people that are going to ride with me, uh, meet up with me, groups, um, individuals, people are hosting me. Um, there's a group in south southern Missouri that is going to get me from Springfield to the Katy Trail. The Katy Trail goes across Missouri. I think it starts in Clinton and it goes to St. Louis. And then from there, I'll take another adventure cycling route from St. Louis to Pittsburgh, where I'll pick up the Gap, the Greater Allegheny Trail. It's a trail I have wanted to do for a long time. And that will get me to another trail, which will get me to Washington, D.C. And I hope to be there at the beginning of June. And of course, I have electric assist, so I can't get those batteries on a plane so I thought, well, I could rent a car, rent a truck, or I could just ride back. So I decided <laughs> I decided I'm going to ride. So from um, Washington, D.C., I'm going to get on the Trans Am, Trans America bike route. This is the oldest bike route across the country. It was designed for the Bicentennial in 1976, and it goes from Virginia and it ends on the Oregon coast where the recumbent retreat is held every September. So my plan is to ride it and be at the recumbent retreat. The um, It's the weekend after Labor Day every every year on at Fort Stevens State Park. So that's the big bulk of my route. And then from there, I'll go down the Pacific Coast, which I've already done three times. And then from Los Angeles, I'll make my way back to the church here in the desert near Palm Springs. So what are we talking, 9, 10, 11 months kind of thing then? I'm thinking 10. Yeah, 9, 10 months. Yeah, I think 1,000 miles a month is a pretty good pretty good amount. Yeah. All right. Well, while you're on your way, of course, what you are so well known for besides Myrtle and riding your trike in amazing, unusual, interesting places – are making wonderful videos about what you do and sharing your experience. So what's the plan for that? How are you going to, are you going to be making videos every day? How are you going to do this, Sylvia? Right. I mean, I, I really do have a plan. I do hope to stay on top of it. Probably not every day, um, you know, because I also have a blog. And so it takes at least two hours to do a video. And it also takes two hours to do a blog. And so I'm hoping to do uh, videos, uh, maybe three, four times a week, and my blog once a week, more like a summary of the week. And so that's, that's kind of my plan. And I hope I can, I hope I can stay on top of it. So this is designed by a triker from Southwest Missouri. His name is Andy O'Neill. And I was online and I, you know, a lot of people say, hey, when you get wherever it is, you know, let us know. We'd love to see you, host you, ride with you, whatever. And I always have to say, you know, I don't, I've just never had a way 
to organize. I don't know how to keep track of contacts so that I know who lives where when I'm going through it. And Andy said, you know what, Sylvia, I think I can help you with that. And so he, I mean, he just donated his time and he has put together this contact form, which is, there's a link to it in the description of every video. And I would love it if people could fill it out so that I know where people are and I can uh, send out emails. So for instance, really just a couple of days into my tour, I'm going to cross into Arizona. So I'm going to send out an email to all the people on the list that are in Arizona and say, hey, I'm coming through. Um, If you would like to uh, ride with me or get together, um, let me know. And so that's pretty much how this form is going to be used. Good. And then finally, let's see how uh, we can uh, help Sylvia with uh, this amazing tour that she's on besides meeting up with her and watching her videos. Uh, I think a little financial help in some ways could be beneficial as well. Sylvia, what have you done to, to help yourself financially on this trip? Yeah, this trip, you know, this is the first time that I have ever you know, publicized one of my tours. Typically I just pick a place and I just go and I ride and, you know, it's just, I just do what I do. But the United States is, um, it's much more expensive here than other places. Like for instance, to stay in a hotel, even in Europe, Spain, France, Italy, Portugal, I could find a place to stay for $30, $40 a night. And, you know, it's in the center of town, it's safe, it's comfortable. And that's just not possible in the US. And so even though I plan to camp as much as possible, even, you know, the camping fees in the US are probably 30 to 50 or $60 a night. Uh, But the weather, of course, is going to make camping impossible. So I know I'm going to have to be in hotels for for safety. And, you know, we're talking 150, maybe over $200. And so I have come up with a, a few ways that I'm hoping I can get support from my uh, followers. So I have uh, one is I set up a Patreon account. So this is a online account that you join and you can join for as little as a dollar. I think Gary has a Patreon as well. And I have set up um, a number of different tiers. So you can just pick one of those and makes it easy to uh, support my tour. And then another thing that I've done is, um, you know, I have this logo And um, you can see it on the screen there. So, you know, this logo was designed by Matt and he was just playing around and he said, Hey, Sylvia, I think you need a logo here. I came up with this thing. Do you want it? And I love it. I think it's really terrific. And so I found a, um, I found an online store. Let's see if I can get it centered there. That's better. Um, Here we go. Uh, so I found a store. Um, it, there's a link in the description of all my videos and you, uh, they have a number of products that I have picked and I have put my logo on them. Um, so there's a hat and a mug and I have a little banner, t-shirts, long sleeve hoodies, um, a bandana and, um, That would be another way to support my tour. And and, uh, Sylvia, we'll put those links in the description of this video as well. And uh, of course, uh, linked to your YouTube channel where they can find that. And yeah, folks, uh, help Sylvia out if you can. I mean, she is a true adventurer, someone that so many of us admire and have admired over the years. So this is a great new uh, tour coming up. And we hope you will support her by showing up, maybe riding with her. Uh, buy some merch, uh, Patreon, any of those things would be great. HP Velotechnic has uh, supported her. Clearly, we've talked about that. Do you have any final thoughts then? Yeah, I just want to say it's so fun to be on- online with with Heiko. This is the first time that we actually are speaking uh, speaking together. And gosh, I've known him for many, many years. And it's, yeah. it's really fun, really fun. Yeah, I, I really like you guys a lot. Yeah. Thanks for the occasion, Gary. 
That's well, weird. I know Heiko and have known him for a number of years, have had the pleasure of hanging out with Heiko. He's toured us around various parts of Germany. Uh, yeah, he's a pretty special guy. I usually don't like to say that in front of him because usually I'm telling him what he's doing wrong. But in this case, I'm going to say it. he's a great guy and we love the people at HP as well. So terrific. Guys, thank you so much, Sylvia. Best of luck to you. We're going to be watching you. Uh, maybe we can uh, check in with you on the tour a few times. You can come oh, on the yeah. show and let us know how you're doing. We'd love to uh, you know, hear from you that. Do a Where's Myrtle segment. Exactly. Where, where, where is new? Yes. Where is Moto Myrtle? Yes, where in the U.S. is Moto Myrtle? <laughs> so great, great. Anyway, so thank you very much, uh, Heiko uh, and HP, for all that you guys do, and Sylvia as well. Yeah. It's been great talking to you guys. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Stay in touch. All right. So Moto Myrtle actually is uh, is in Arizona. So Sylvia actually took off yesterday. We recorded uh, that interview uh, last week. So we wish you all the best, uh, Sylvia, and uh, we, we will be following along the way, as I said, and uh, hopefully catch up with you uh, on your tour. All right, let's move on to the next segment, which is TerraCycle. Many of you are aware that TerraCycle is in a transition. Uh, Pat Franz is retiring, and uh, we sat down uh, last week with uh, Pat and the new guys, Kaz and Quinn, and uh, talked about what's going on, what has gone on, what's going on now, and what will be going on at TerraCycle. So, Larry, let's peek in at this. We are in TerraCycle, and uh, we're visiting with our pals, Pat and Quentin and Kaz. Guys, how are you doing? Doing good. Doing well. How's it so going, Gary? We're doing great here. We're in Portland, Oregon. You guys uh, will have a little story to tell us today uh, about a transition. Oh. And uh, we're going to, first of all, take a look at the a bit of the history uh, uh, of TerraCycle. And uh, then we're going to bring you up to date on what's going on right now, guys. So let's start with uh, Pat, who, of course, is the founder of uh, TerraCycle. Pat, uh Let's talk a little bit about your history. We've got a nice little slideshow here to right. uh, to pop up. Let's start with this right here. Oh, yeah. I was riding around Crater Lake on a, the first Terza I ever made. Yeah. Ter right so, forward. yeah. So Terza is one of the, is was a, a bike that you created, actually. And uh, let's let's jump into the uh, some of the innovation innovations uh, that you came up with early. So I, I used to be a hardware software engineer in the high tech business and uh, started a couple companies. And um, it's it's an intense business and uh, you work long hours and you make products and they have, you know, six months in the sun. And then somebody else comes along behind you and comes up with something better and faster and whatever. And uh, so I got super tired of doing that and decided, you know, I've always wanted to make bikes. And I looked around and decided, you know, recumbents are the coolest bikes. I'm going to make recumbents. A configuration I, I settled on for a first bike was a short wheelbase bike. Um, and the, the green bike that's in those pictures, um, the one with me sitting on it and the one with the trailer attached, uh, that was a test bed bike that I made um, because after riding a bunch of different bikes, I decided that there was a lot of different handling and stuff going on. And I wanted to make bikes that handled really well. And so I needed to figure out what it was that made good handling. So I designed a bike where everything adjusted. So the cranks went forward and back and the seat went forward and back so you could control the, the center of gravity and uh, the fork offset was adjustable and the head offset was adjustable so you could change that aspect of the handling. And then the seat back angle adjusted, the seat bottom angle adjusted, and the handlebars adjusted. And uh, I rode that bike around for a couple of years uh, with- and to, put a time, and to put a time frame on this, how long before the guys uh, on your left were born was this? Uh, they, were, they were born, but uh, probably in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> this would have been the 90s, right? Uh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, mid 90s. Um, okay. So I started, started TerraCycle in 96, actually. So this would have been 97 uh, kind of time frame. And um, I rode the bike around with an Allen wrench in my pocket. And, uh, you know, when I 
encounter something unusual like railroad tracks or a super bumpy corner or something, I'd, I'd stop and I'd tweak the bike and I'd ride back and forth. And then when I got home, I'd make notes about you know what worked and what didn't and stuff. And then I used the geometry from that um, to build the, the Terrazaw. And uh, all the Terrazaws were custom built um, to customer specifications with whatever they wanted. Uh, the bikes that were in that the, the previous pictures there both had roll-offs on them. Um, stainless dropouts and roll-offs. And, and the orange one there is a very special bike called Eddie that I made for Peter Lewis. Um, that's all in the Eddie Merckx colors and it's got um, Eddie Merckx color decals and everything on it. It was a very fun bike to build. Um, Peter came out and helped me finish it out and uh, it was a lot of fun. All right. And talk about some of the other things that you worked on in those um, earlier years. Yeah, you know, looking back, I've worked on a lot of things. Um, the cargo monster in the upper right there that was a, a fun project um where we built a, a rear end that you could bolt on to trikes and put extra cycle uh, bags and and platforms and everything on and, and turn your bike into a real cargo hauler and that was very popular for a while and then this kind of faded out and most people um, wanted trikes for fun and not for for uh, things like cargo hauling um and that odd thing uh, in the middle lower right, um, I, I've done several projects for um, an outfit uh, called the Tetra Society. They're out of Vancouver, Washington, or Vancouver, BC. Um, and they hook up people that have some special need with people that like to make things. And so I made several projects for them. And that particular one is a crawling aid for somebody that was uh, very seriously injured in a car accident. And uh, in order to learn to use his body again, um, his doctors wanted him to start from the beginning. And then the two other pictures on the, the bottom left there are uh, 23 tooth uh, idlers. Um, the, the bare one there is one of the first ones that came off the machine. And then of course the, the black one is uh, all finished out. But. The idlers of course are what you became known for uh, among many other things eventually, but. Yeah, they're, they're one of the, the, the two things. Um, you know, when, we, when I started out making the, the, the Terraza, I made a lot of parts for the bike that um, I didn't think there were good enough ones out there in the market. Um, so I made the idlers for it and I made the, the folding stem for it and, and things like that. And people would come to me and say, I really like your bike, but can I buy one of those stems for my bike? Can I buy the idlers? Um, and then when uh, Baketa came to me and wanted to buy 500 uh, of the stems, it was like, oh, yeah, um, there's kind of a market for the accessories. Um, and while I really liked making the bikes, uh, it was a lot of work, um, you know, per bike. And I wasn't making a lot of money um, for all the time that I was putting in on making the bikes. But I had, you know, CNC machine ready to make more stuff. So um, I decided let's address parts market because no one else is making all the little parts that really are necessary to make uh, recumbent riding fun. So I switched over to, to making parts. That's awesome. Well, that's great, Pat. That's that's a really important part of the story there. So that's great. All right. So then uh, you started the business. You're doing that. But in the meantime, you spent plenty of time on trikes uh, um, and touring around various places. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the highlights of your some of the tours over the years? Well, one of the most fun parts about being in the bike business is getting to go and ride places <laughs> and meet other cyclists. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've been fortunate to, to travel lots of places. Um, that picture in the upper left uh, is the Algal region uh, in southern Germany uh, when I rode uh, the Bodensee Koenigsee Rodweg, Rodweg across southern Germany um, with my 15 year old. And we had an absolute blast. That other picture with the cargo monster with the, the four panniers on it, uh, that's at Tot. Uh, and I believe that's Lonnie Morse riding that trike. Um, then the lower left one there with me, uh, you can't really tell from that picture, but I am completely soaked and dirty because uh, that's at um, the recumbent retreat out on the Oregon coast. And uh, sometimes it rains at the Oregon coast. And uh, that weekend it happened to rain a lot. And uh, that was a, I like a 40 mile ride or something like that. And I didn't have fenders. Uh, that was a, a brand new to us um, GT7. Um, 
And uh, yeah, fortunately it wasn't too cold, but uh, uh, there's dirt from the front wheels uh, all up my arms. <laughs> anyway, after a little while you get so dirty, you don't care. You just figure I'm gonna take a shower when I get back. The trike there by the river, that's uh, also a tot. Um, that's a little ways from Enaville. And uh, there's a, a cool rock right by the edge of the river. So I like to park trikes on there. I even have a picture of a Bellow mobile parked on that rock like that. <laughs> uh, it was a little bit harder to get the Bellow up there than the trikes. But and anyway, the last picture is a very fun trip I did um, with you, Gary, actually. And um, <clears throat> Mel from uh, Recumbent PDX, that's up in uh, San Juan's. Uh, yeah, one of, one, of Mel's, one of Mel's tours up there. We have had yeah, fun over that, the years on that. Yeah, super fun, super fun time up there. All right. All right, so let's jump back to uh, the shop back in the earlier years. You've had two shops, so you're in, currently in a newer shop, uh, but this was the first. So uh, tell us a little bit about that old shop and uh, what went on there. <laughs> well, that old shop was originally built as a dairy barn, and then it was used for to fix cars. And... Um, when we were there, um, a printer, printing business owned the building. And uh, I was riding by one day, coming back from my daughter's school, and I noticed this, this building that looked like they had some less than ideally used space. So I popped in and talked to the owner and wound up renting a little 400 square foot room. The rent was right and all my spreadsheets started working. So um, I had a business and moved in there. And uh, the picture on the bottom there is the inside of the shop. Um, so you can see it wasn't very big, but I, I packed a lathe and a welder and a CNC machine and a desk and a workbench in there and uh, and made bikes. It was a little bit warmer and a little bit drier than it was outside. Was was yeah. Pat's common refrain about the old shop, and you kind of you would work by going from from heat lamp to heat lamp at each of the stations to do to do whatever needed to get done. Yeah, so was, clearly, uh, you didn't ask much from it, but you got what you needed. We, we didn't ask much. We didn't pay much. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a fun place. And, and we wound up uh, renting most of the building from them by the time uh, we moved out. Uh, and we would sublet um, parts of it to other bike builders. Um, but the, the picture on the far right there is one of the parties uh, that we'd have there, uh, the local recumbent club would hold races every Memorial Day weekend. So the last weekend in May, they'd hold races and we'd have an open house party and invite everybody over. It was always a very good time. And that uh, continued, but, right? That continued, yeah, yeah. When, uh, so in, let's go uh, to the new shop here. Yeah, so uh, you you had to make a move. What? Tell us about how you got, uh, why did you decide to move? I think maybe we already know from- Well, you know, why I was decided to move was uh, the landlord, the printer, uh, decided to retire and the printing business uh, is a very difficult business to be in uh, anymore because everybody like us prints things on laser printers all the time. And uh, so he sold the building and retired. Um, I actually tried to buy the building, but- uh, the city wanted it to be condos, and uh, they made it clear that they did not want industrial use there anymore, and uh, would not be approving things if I wanted to do things. So um, I looked around, looked around, looked around, and found a very nice building um, not too far away, and we moved there uh, in 2012 in the middle of winter, um, <laughs> and uh, that was that was quite an ordeal. Um, Wow, so you've been there over ten years already. It's uh... oh, over ten years in this building. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the new building is, you know, bigger, taller, stronger, lighter, brighter, warm, um, much, much nicer. Anyway, we've tried to continue the the tradition of having uh, open houses and parties at the shop. It's it's a great deal of fun to have everybody over. And, All right. It's now always let's... fun. You get a whole bunch of bike nerds together, and and you get to talk about fun. Boy. Stuff. It is. I'm with you there. All right. Well, speaking of a whole bunch of bike nerd, nerds getting together, uh, you had occasion to attend a few uh, trade shows where you encountered other bike nerds from around the world. In this case, uh, Recumbent Cycle Con was someplace you showed up to every year. That's I'm sure where I met you for the first time, Pat. And I think it was. Did, yeah. So tell us about your experience uh, with Recumbent Cycle Cons over the years. Well, um, uh, Charles and I talked about bike shows for several years before he he finally uh, started up Recumbent CycleCon. Um, 
And uh, the first ones were down in Pomona, which is where he's from. Yeah, it was fun to get together and have, uh, you know, uh, a trade show here in the U.S. Um, to be able to show our stuff and meet everybody else. And and for me, go around and look at all the other bikes and trikes and figure out what they needed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, that helps you out there. And then also there were various um, accolades that came your way. Um, every year there was a recumbent industry recognition award at CycleCon. And in 2014, you got your due. How was that? <laughs> uh, that was a, a fun surprise. I didn't know Charles was up to that. Um, but, uh, yeah, Charles decided that um, I would uh, contributed something to the recumbent industry. So um, a little bit of backstory, actually, maybe part of this is um, back in the day before recumbent cycle con, um, I'd, I'd be going down to uh, uh, Interbike uh down in, in las vegas uh, i guess the first time in anaheim but in las vegas and i decided that the recumbent people there were all spread out and and they didn't really know each other and stuff like that so uh, i organized dinners uh to get everybody together and, and say hey let's all meet at this one buffet you know tomorrow night at, at seven or whatever and uh, and that pretty quickly grew to um, I needed to um, like reserve a separate room at the buffet and sell tickets and stuff like that uh, for everybody coming. Um, so there was a clear need uh, that people wanted to get together um, in the in the industry uh, just to, to talk about common issues and problems and working together and, and stuff like that. And uh, so um, that was I think. Part of it, and Charles and I started talking then, um, and that kind of morphed into uh, the recumbent cycle. To, yeah, into the largest trade show for recumbents here in the states. Anyways, now there is a larger trade show that's uh, that's a festival onto itself, held in Germany every year, called Spetzi. And uh, we've both been there. It's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing place. And there's is going to be a change this year as it's as it's moved if, with new mm -hmm. ownership. But tell me about your experience with Spetsy, because you also have uh, a bit of business that you do in Europe. What's what's that yeah. about? So I've been to Spetsy several times. Uh, it's always a fun show. It's always a amazing blizzard of work, um, and you know, meeting people and learning things. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and and you know, part of the show is 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 business and showing people things. Um, but the, the spirit of the show is just very fun. And then people go there to have fun. And uh, Kaz and Quentin can attest to that. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun to go to. Yeah. Um, so we've been there several times. Um, the, the first time we went uh, was 2008. That's the picture on the lower left, lower right there. Um, that um, our uh, EU distributor, Akleta, um, had a booth there. And Akleta was also the distributor for ice trikes. And so they had an ice trikes and uh, TerraCycle booth. And I think after that, um, I started having their, their own booth. They realized that the show was was so important that they needed to send their all their own people there. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that picture of me with the suitcase is uh, getting ready to go to Spetsy 2008. Um, so and then the picture with all the the green uh, pop up tent there and stuff. Uh, that's Quentin there in the background in the, in the, in the black shirt. All right. Well, Pat, that's great. Let's, uh, if we could at this moment, then let's uh, get a little bit more background on the guys uh, on your left there uh, yeah. who are part of TerraCycle and have been for a little while. Uh, Kaz, why don't we start with you? Tell us about uh, your background and how you got to, to TerraCycle and what it's been like up until recently. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always kind of liked bikes you know, along with a lot of people who are already here. Uh, and then I graduated from college in 2010 in the midst of a recession, looking for any job I could in the world. Uh, I got a job at a little TerraCycle shop, uh, just tagging and bagging, just doing things in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually Pat ran out of work for me. So then I got a job with the woodworkers next door. And then Pat had more work because it's seasonal. And so it, it all came back in the summer. And that started ever since then. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a slow, gradual build, working my way through pretty much every position in the shop. Well, what, what Kaz isn't saying is he's really smart and he's really quick with things. So I would find more and more things for him to do. <laughs> Which was <laughs> a really, smart way to go. I, 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 I <laughs> give the things to Kaz and they would they would get done well. And uh, 
I appreciate you know, that. As, as an employer, that's 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 a, a, a very cool thing to have. Um, yeah, that's what you're looking for, isn't it? I mean, for sure. Looking for. And so, uh, yeah, Kaz just kept kind of doing more. <laughs> more <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, it's to Pat's credit, he keeps feeding you things uh, as an employee, and so you know, it got to the point where nowadays we're doing a lot more here, uh, but it's. Mm-hmm. You know, it's boiling the frog or whatever you want to say. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't feel like a, a gigantic climbing the mountain. Oh, there it is. Climbing, you're climbing a mountain. There it is. All right. So uh, with that, let's move over to Quentin. <laughs> Quentin, what is your backstory here with uh, TerraCycle? So I've been, uh, you know, riding bikes ever since I was a kid and started to get into it in a real serious way when I was 18, uh, riding fixed gears and working in a bike shop. I've Worked in a bike shop for about seven years. And during all that, I was going to trade school, learning to be a CNC programmer and machinist, started working in machine shops. And uh, when I was working in uh, aerospace and defense electronics, doing a bit of tool and die work, I was getting uh, a bit burned out with the company I was with and the work I was doing and uh, really wanted to change the pace. And my old partner had a friend who worked up here and uh, turned out they were looking for a CNC program. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, we know somebody. Why don't you come on up and uh, give the place a look, see what you think. And a few short months later, I uh, moved from L.A. to Portland. And and when was that, Quinn? That was in 2018. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got here in the summer. All right. So, uh, Pat, you, you turned out to find two very resourceful Fellas, that could help you out, and uh, and then over the course of the next few years, uh, up until I guess fairly recently, uh, things were going along. But then at some point here, you started thinking about a transition. Uh, so why don't we start, Pat, with you and tell us what those thoughts were like and what we what were you thinking about? Well, um, you know, part of being a manager, part of being a leader, is is training up the people that are coming after you and. Uh, I'm kind of looking around to see, you know, who's that going to be? Um, and uh, I didn't expect to actually retire until much later. And uh, but it, my life just kind of evolved, and and I realized, you know, um, I can retire. Um, Kaz and Quentin are ready to to run the show, um, and they'd like to. They're they're ready. I, I, and I didn't want to hold them back from that. Um, and um, I still plan on being involved, and and, and I still love cycling and, and uh, recumbents and, and everything. Um, but uh, they're ready to take over and run it, and they have they have the all the energy and all the skills to do it. <laughs> and it was kind of just a, a feeling that it was time. Um, oh, yeah, so, clearly. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I'm, well, Cass, let's go ahead and, and uh, you could tell me what you want. I was going to ask what role you guys are playing, but go, go ahead and reflect upon how it was for you, and then tell us. Yeah, both Quentin and Cass, tell me about what uh, r- what role you think you are uh, you're going to be playing or what you've decided for yourselves. Okay, I, I, first I just wanted to add on to what Pat was saying where we really kind of started talking in earnest about Pat's retirement in 2019, mm-hmm. uh, late 2019, which then turned into early 2020, which then turned into Something a reason to, to, yeah, the world in the middle of there. to not do it right <laughs> away. And so... This is, I mean, maybe from the outside, it seems sudden, but for a lot of us here, it's been something we've been working on for, for years in kind of an explicit manner. Uh, so, yeah. Good. Okay. So now, clearly, this is a story of continuity because, uh, you know, you guys have been there for a while. Obviously, you you both know what's going on. So, yeah, Kaz, what, uh, what role then do you and Quentin have to kind of decide how you're going to divide things up, I assume? Do you, have, you, have you got some set roles that uh, you've thought about? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, it's, we're not going down a list and saying you are in charge of this and I am in charge of that necessarily. Uh, but I am a little bit more on kind of the, the computer spreadsheet ends of things, and Quentin's a little bit more on the actually making the products and running the machines. Uh, ends of things, and that's just you know drawing on our different our expertises, if you will. Uh, yeah, I've been able to it. I've been able to bring a lot of uh, information and techniques from some of the other fields I've worked in. I've been lucky enough to do everything from, like I said, aerospace and defense electronics to doing a little bit of uh, making parts for medical companies, making parts for uh, electric sports cars, 
um, being able to bring in a lot of uh, sort of different and disparate techniques and put them to use here at TerraCycle. Well, what he's not saying is he's he's got a lot of skills on, on how to make things <laughs> and, and how to organize a shop and, and, and program machines and stuff like that. So yeah, Clearly, he, he's in the right place for doing that sort of oh, stuff. So. I, I, yeah, he's a bug in a rug. <laughs> <laughs> I do like it here. Tell me about the crew. Uh, we, we see who's running things, but tell me about the rest of the crew, guys. Kaz or Quentin? Well, they're a bunch of cut-ups, obviously. <laughs> right. uh, I mean, it's just, it's a it's a great, we got a great group here. Everyone loves each other and gets along, uh, even to the point that, you know, Aaron Hand, who works remote, uh, answering a lot of the emails and whatnot, he's the guy on the trek there, and we didn't want to leave him out. So we made sure we, we kept him in because he's just about just as much a part of the family as anyone else. Uh, besides he has the sense of humor to appreciate <laughs> being <laughs> put on a trike like that. He yeah, doesn't like showing up as a sick person. Yep. All right. Let's go along here. And this is more day to day. What's going on here on this table? Well, this is, I mean, kind of hearkening back to, we talked about being at Spetsy and we've got our EU distributor and, to whom we send large shipments. This is one of those in process. This is getting bagged and kind of sub bagged and ready to be put into a huge box to be right. shipped all the way over to this Germany. This is half or less of is, Right, because this doesn't include any of the fairings or anything like that. So there's, you know, a bunch more to be put into to, to huge boxes. All right. Now I can, I, I remember Quentin at uh, CycleCon this year doing a, uh, a talk and demonstrating what he does and what goes on uh, at your shop. And he's so knowledgeable about stuff and so willing to share his knowledge and ideas. And I, I think this kind of uh, permeates uh, what you guys do. Tell us about what sort of educational programs you like to do and what that what's that thrust about? I mean, you really kind of hit the nail on the head there. Sharing this kind of information and teaching each other these skills is a huge foundational part of TerraCycle company culture. Uh, this is Mike actually giving you a presentation on how we document and organize uh, information that lets us set up and run our CNC programs. Um, and we've taught each other a lot of tips and tricks, just like, you know, Machinists share information in the shop. We all share information with each other, making us even better tradespeople and even better at making TerraCycle parts for y'all. A thread that has run through uh, TerraCycle from the beginning right through to today with the transition and all. And basically the thread uh, is, is around having fun. And uh, I think nothing shows that better than this particular glamour shot of Kaz trying to hide himself there, but... I was really the where you're going with that segue. Yeah, yeah. Well, luckily for you, I went in a good direction. <laughs> Anyways, talk to me, uh, guys, about the importance of enjoying what you do while you're working. <laughs> We're going to talk over this photo, okay? <laughs> now I'll come back to you. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if you're not having fun doing what you do, then you're not going to do it as well. You're not going to be willing to, to take the time to do it correctly. Uh, you're not going to... You know, I mean, not that we're asking people to work insane hours or whatnot, but if it's if it's not great weather and you're having trouble waking up and you know you gotta get to work on time and actually show up and do the job right, if you work with people you love and the things you do are enjoyable, then yeah, there you go. Then you're gonna love doing it and you're gonna do it much better. Right. Okay. I, I just I wanted to end it there because. I, I can't think of a better way to, to to show people what it is that you guys not only do, I think they know what you make, but it's important to know uh, how you make it and that you enjoy uh, making it as well. So let's just finish up one last uh, question. What should the customers expect? Our first big push is just going to be offer the things like to be able to make the things that we offer because uh, we've had so much of our store out of stock for a couple of years now. And with, maybe one or two exceptions, that's not the case anymore. Uh, and so to be able to, to finish off those couple of, of, of exceptions and then uh, get back into the R&D game. Yeah. 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 You know, a few little R&D things. There's there's a new um, part that Quentin made yeah. for, the, for the trike type stands. Yeah, we've been experimenting with a few different uh, sort of techniques and practices to help um, – make new products and even some existing ones fit better into our workflow. And <laughs> as you can see, we make robust parts here at TerraCycle. Uh, so um, is, it's okay, right? It's, it's okay. 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. There you um, are. But that's that's something that that when we bought trike tight, um, they were made one way and and they were hard to make and time consuming and and didn't work as well as they could. So I redesigned it to make it a little bit easier to make and have better functionality. And then Quentin redesigned it to make it even easier to make and better functionality. Um, so it's you know always kind of progressing along. Yeah. Um, this is just one of the, it's one of the many small part, uh, many small fruits of uh, the process of constant improvement. All right. And a lot of uh, things like this you're going to see uh, coming out of our shop. Very good. Well, there we go. We moved you guys around a little bit, but uh, <laughs> there's the crew. Uh, and I, I really wanted to, uh, to thank you, uh, Kaz and Pat and Quinton, for uh, taking the time to be on the Laid Back Bike Report with me. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to work with you guys. We've done, uh, Pat and I, over the years, um, many, uh, many different oh, things. Yeah. And, uh, and you've always supported the Laid Back Bike Report, so I wanted to take a, a minute out also to thank you so much for your support and sponsorship over the years. You've been great. You're, uh, right. the, you're like the first, the first ones. You're always there when I need it. So thank you <laughs> very much for that, guys, since I have you all together. So. Yeah. All right. Fun work with you, Gary. It's great to be able to talk about what's happening here at TerraCycle. And yeah. Of course. All right. Any final thoughts, guys? Um, see you at Betsy, I guess. <laughs> yeah. That sounds great. All right, then. Thanks. Uh, we'll see Thanks. you guys around. All right. Take care, Take care of you. Bye bye. All right. TerraCycle guys are awesome. Uh, Pat has got a full schedule for his retirement. He is already working on the trailer for uh, John Hotkin, the inner tuba. We're going to, John is going to be on the show next month talking about his uh, Mississippi uh, river tour that uh, he's going to be doing, pulling a trailer with his tuba and doing another tour of the U S uh, and Pat's going to help him out with that quite a bit. I know. So, and I'm sure he's got plenty of other things uh, scheduled, including maybe a trip to Spetsy. So, you might see him there, as he mentioned. So thanks a lot, TerraCycle. And uh, with that, we're going to go to viewer submissions. And uh, this was one I got uh, from uh, my buddy Jim Schneider, uh, who is the owner of Ride South. And he messaged me the uh, day before yesterday. Here's what he had to say. Ride South Recumbents has been the go-to recumbent shop in the South since 1999. I would like to find a passion-filled person to continue the mission in the area as I'm contemplating retirement. The website ridesouth.com illustrates an awesome shop in a perfect recreational area near Barnett Reservoir close to Jackson, Mississippi. A beautiful building and adjacent property with a test track comes with the package. So you can call Jim at uh, 601-291-1004 or email him at uh, oneoak at me.com. And I will uh, post uh, the telephone number and that email in the description of the video here. And uh, look, uh, Jackson, Mississippi immediately brings to mind uh, someone on the show here who might have a little insight uh, as to uh, Ride South, and that's Trey. Um, Larry, you want to pop Trey up here? And uh, Trey, uh, you've had experience with Ride South over the years. You're not uh, that far away from them. Uh, tell us what you think about all this. Well, I'd love to. So, you know, Jim's Ride South, it's a, it's a very nice shop. Um, it ranks up there with many of the nicer shots I've been in and you and I have been in quite a few. So the showroom is well lit. He's got really nice floor to ceiling windows. It's very spacious. Uh, he's got a large service area, plenty of room to service trikes and bikes. And he's got a test track next door and he's close to multi-use trails. So that makes the shop an ideal location for test rides and group rides. Um, I just hope that, um, whoever buys it, well, First off, I'd like to say I hope that Jim continues, you know, to participate with the Bent World in the future because he's been a valuable member um, and the recumbent community really needs him to stick around and share that knowledge. Um, I hope that whomever takes over the shop continues to um, foster like the sense of community and education that Jim has done through the years. Um, he's hosted multiple 
group rides, destination rides to our, uh, we've got some really nice multi-use trails here and in the area right next to the shop. Um, we also have some two rails to trails that are always expanding. Um, and he hosts uh, event or destination rides, I should say, to that location. So I hope whomever buys it continues to do that. And um, I hope um, this gets resolved soon and we can continue on and yeah. So uh, I, and I totally agree with that. And uh, I, as far as I know, there are not a whole lot of recumbent shops anywhere close to, uh, to where this shop is in Mississippi, even in neighboring That's states, correct. it's pretty sparse, yeah. right? So uh, I uh, think, yeah, we don't have much around here. There's, we have several really nice bike shops, but and there's a few, I think, that are attempting to do a bit of recumbent stuff. And I've been by there, but they just don't, they, they're regular Delta frame bike shops. So they just don't have that knowledge that uh, Jim shop offers. And yeah. so, so if you find the right person, if you're out there watching uh, this, uh, this right now, uh, contact Jim. Uh, like he says, if it's a motivated kind of person, it seems like there's lots of opportunity there. And uh uh, that region certainly could uh, could use uh, uh, that bike shop, that recumbent bike shop, and maybe even an expanded one. So, uh, good luck uh, to to Jim in his retirement, and uh, we hope uh, hope you find someone uh, good to take over there, Jim. All right, guys. So uh, that's the uh, viewer submissions. If you have uh, something you'd like to share on the laid back bike report. All you got to do is send us an email at uh, laidbackbikereport at gmail.com, and uh, we'll see if we can't uh, get you on the air here. All right, how about uh, our sponsors who make this show possible every month? Let's kick it off with uh, the guys you saw just a few minutes ago, TerraCycle. From fairings to headrests, whatever accessory you have and whatever accessory you need, Pat and crew, uh, we might just say Kaz and uh, Quentin, have you covered and trailside trikes if you find yourself in florida near the with Cooch trail or in knoxville tennessee check out andrew's shop and amazing crew and terra trike and green speed trikes your vision whatever it is terra trike has a trike to take you there and green speed cutting edge designs create performance through aussie ingenuity and Laidback Cycles, the top USA dealer for Terra Trike and the premier source for Cat Trike, Ice, and Green Speed. We give you the freedom to ride and Avenue Trikes. With the gearing you need and the comfort you want, it's time to enjoy riding again. They're in stock, ready to ship, and only $19.95. Dealer inquiries are welcome. And Azub. In addition to the titanium suspension, another technological gem brought to you by Azub is an optional folding mechanism. It's not only easy to operate, but it works great and looks fantastic. And Recumbent PDX, Cat Trikes West Coast Megastore. Schedule your test ride on trikes with pedal assist electric from both Bosch and Bafang, roll off and schlumpf, component groups, and adaptive builds. Experience the joy of Cat Trike and Eco Cycles. Adding e-assist to your vent can be a daunting task. With total focus on customer service, the experts at Eco Cycles make this upgrade simple and worry-free. Check out Eco Cycles today. All right, announcements. Uh, as we mentioned last month, we got to remind you that we are heading to Spetsy uh, in Germany uh, next month already. Trey and I are heading over to Lochringen, and uh, we'll be uh, heading out on a road trip after that uh, over to the Czech Republic and uh, and Italy. So we're going to stop at Katanga, and we're going to stop and see Hansa at Azub. And uh, there's a shop in uh, in Italy. Uh, we're going to stop and see a recumbent shop there as well, do a little touring around. So we should have a ton of video for you guys when we get back. So I hope you'll be looking forward to seeing some of that. Now, the next Layback Bike Report will be April the 2nd, 2 p.m. Eastern time, as always. As I mentioned, John Hodkin in Inner Tuba. 
uh, is going to be on talking about his Mississippi tour coming up very shortly. And uh, we've got some other things we're working on as well for next month's show. Now, if you want to support the Laid Back Bike Report, you can do so by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to us on YouTube, and clicking that little white eye over there. Take it to our Laid Back Bike Report website where you can learn so much more about what, we, uh, what we're what we doing. We, we've we got the past shows, shows that are coming up. You can learn about some of the merchandise that we sell. And uh, you can also click on a link to take you to Patreon. And all these folks have joined, support us uh, monthly for as little as a dollar a month, actually. And we do have uh, a couple of new Patreons this month, Jerry and Elizabeth Daminato from uh, Guelph, Ontario. Good friends of ours, actually, and known them for many years. Started out riding and become in tandems uh, with them. So, Jerry and Elizabeth, thank you so much for becoming Patreons of the Laid Back Bike Report. Now, let's see. Uh, crew guys, come on up. Here we go. So, Larry and Trey, uh, guys, thank you so much for uh, doing a super job, as always, uh, making the show go so smoothly. And uh, sure appreciate it, uh, as I always do, guys. So, thanks a lot. And uh, folks, thanks uh, to all of you as well for watching this month and every month. And so until next time, from all of us here at the Laid Back Bike Report, so long, Bent Riders. <laughs>